Every entrepreneur has a story. Welcome to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur, where each episode, your host, Brian Carney, will share a drink with a successful business owner and have them discuss their unique journey, gaining insight on what it takes to be an entrepreneur and the different ways to get there. Brian isn't just a beer nerd. He's also the co-founder of Rivers Edge Advisors, a financial planning firm headquartered in Delaware, specializing in working with business owners. It's time to pour yourself a drink and enjoy a happy half hour with an entrepreneur. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Brian Carney. My guest today is Matt Coyne from Brandywine Mergers and Acquisitions. I'm really excited to talk to Matt today because not only does he own a business, but his business helps business owners sell their companies and prepare for the next chapter in their life. He also just started another business called the M&A Mastery Program, which helps financial advisors be better equipped to help their clients sell their business. So Matt worked for GE for a number of years and then started Brandywine in 2001. So for this episode, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to try a beer that I've never had before. And I'm going to go with uh, Costumes and Karaoke from Dogfish Head down in Milton, Delaware. Um, apparently, this came out in the fall, so I'm a little bit late. Uh, Matt actually doesn't drink. So Matt, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be drinking today. Well, today I'm also sporting uh, the, the Delaware vibe. This is Morphine, which is from our friends at Swell Joe in Lou's. Perfect. A friend of mine turned this on. Now, this stuff is like Morphine. I mean, get it. It is... <laughs> I have been tired all day, <laughs> um, but they were a couple different ones awake and some really good ones. Uh, great family place, beachside, uh, order online, 50 bucks free shipping, great stuff. Really, really good coffee. And who would have thought, you know, the B Delaware beaches, but I they it. appreciate a little help and it's been excellent. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a link to their website in our show. Yeah, notes. Swell Joe, nicest people. They sent me a card when they sent the stuff in here and she called to make sure it came in. I'm like, that's incredible. We know each other. Yeah. It was my first order. It's good. You can't beat that customer service. You don't get that anymore. No, you don't. But you do in Delaware. Yeah, that's true. Delaware, the great state. Um, all right. Well, let's start a little bit. Tell us a little bit about how you worked for GE for a number of years and then you made the leap into entrepreneurship. So how did that all happen and how'd that go down? Oh, well, long story. All right. But so I worked for GE and then I ended up shifting two firms, you know, that's what happens when you go to G, right? You do about seven or eight years, then they pick you out and you make some money going to one firm and then you make some money going to another firm. So there right. was a son, I was living in England at the time I ran a foundry, an aerospace foundry, I had 500 employees, 400 union, um, steelworker union types and a uh, uh, hundred engineers in the middle yeah. of uh, Yorkshire, England, in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Um, great people, solid people, but I had the benefit. You either worked in the foundry or you worked at the supermarket. So we had a loyal workforce, right? Yeah. People, people knew where their bread was butter. But so it was acquired by an American company that I was working for. So I, I land there at like 33. Okay. <laughs> I'm a finance guy running an aerospace foundry. Don't know, you know, what's going on, which way is up. Yeah. But I do remember after about two and a half years, my wife and I were kind of talking about it. And uh, she told me one day, she said, um, it's raining sideways. It got dark at like four o'clock. She said, um, I'm thinking about going home. Are you coming? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess, guess we're leaving. Guess what? Well, well, I guess it was on the table. And then the, Lisa was over here visiting my partner, Frank Michael. Yeah. Um, with our new, our fourth that was born in England. And uh, she called me and I had been in a Sunday morning review. Now check this out. A Sunday morning review from nine to 12 with the CEO of the company I was working for. And it was blood on the walls yeah it was horrible <laughs> and i'm like the american i'm used to this my my british staff they're like apoplectic so on the way home my cell phone rings and it's lisa she said i think i found a house that when we move back to america i'd like to buy it. i said buy it really it's time buy it so that was it so when i went there i had a deal that i could stay for three years they wanted me for three years then after three years i had to deal with the the president of the division that if I was after three years, he'd move me anywhere in the world I wanted to go, whether I stayed with the company or not, because they needed this position to, to be somebody. He said he didn't want someone who was worried about their career. Right. Because it was going to be you know, some career limiting decisions that needed to be made. And I'm like, okay, that's me. So I, I, I pulled the string and I came back here and they moved me here. So he stuck, gave him, gave him his word and he gave so, me his word and stuck. So you started Brandywine right away as soon as you came back to the States? Yeah, I would have swept floors. So I'm 33. <laughs> I've been in the corporate world since 21. Yeah. And 
it, it, okay such a grind like right it was the jack welch days it was yeah. restructure restructure i survived layoff after layoff after layoff consolidation it was like i needed a bit of a detox and so frank my partner came to england he said i'm thinking about starting a business brokerage i'm like dude i don't care what you do i'm, uh, I'm with you because i'm coming <laughs> home i need to detox which i did so i got all that good corporate experience but i'm one of the ones who was lucky that that I was able to, I was able to get off of that. I can't imagine still doing that to this day, twenty years later. Yeah, absolutely. So you are you represent business owners on on the sell side, correct? Only on the sell side. Yeah, talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the type of businesses that you typically work with, and your and your your mark your niche market that you work in. Well, it's, it, they're all family held. They're all closely held businesses. So the thing that brings them together is they all make at least a quarter million dollars of earnings for, for the owners. So they got to be profitable, reasonably profitable. Yeah. And they go up to about 3 million of EBITDA, which is cash flow, if you will. So the reason I do that is the bigger investment banks will do 3 million and higher. Okay. So I kind of play underneath them for companies that are complicated, sophisticated, manufacturing, distribution, professional services that are a little bit too small for someone like a Janie Montgomery Scott um, or Goldman Sachs to handle. So we we come right into that niche. I'm like really all about the niche. And that's, so that's very that's targeted. It is very targeted, but but um, it has to be because there are you can go to a bigger investment bank and get people that have more stuff than we have to offer. I don't have in-house counsel. I don't. You know, I don't have a huge infrastructure of MBAs on staff. I have, right. I have exactly what I need. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's, but we, all of our clients are family there. It's about the family. It's about the individual. So it's all that soft stuff. Sure. That makes a difference. Yeah. No, uh, that makes total sense. So tell what is your role at the firm or what, what role do you play? Anymore, 20 years on, I am the, uh, I'm the rainmaker. So okay. I do a lot of the business development work. I'm out there bringing in new business. Um, I manage the accounts, but I have good, I have good folks that kind of manage the actual engagement itself. So I'll bring people in, I'll work with them, answer their questions, try to under, get them to understand the M&A process, what it is we do, mm -hmm. bring them in. And then, you know, if there's a conference call with a, with a buyer, I'm usually on the call. So I kind of come in at the, the high touch points. Yeah. Um, but I have other folks to kind of manage the process, confidentiality agreements, getting books out, doing all that type of stuff. So I'm the, for better, for worse, business development person. What's your favorite part about what you do every day? Closings. Yeah. Ain't nothing better than a closing when you're sitting there <laughs> and you're just driving, you know, you're on, you're on the side of the road having a nice Wawa hoagie <laughs> and you look at your phone and there's like $150,000 that wasn't there when you started your hoagie. Yeah. Like that's, that's I'm like, dang, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know what it is as an entrepreneur, anybody who's a business owner out there, you know, you're like, I did that. Right. Yeah, baby. Absolutely. I did that. <laughs> you know, because I, I found the seller and yeah. I found the buyer and I put them together. Now, anybody could do that. Right. But in my line of work, that's what we do. Sure. Um, there's businesses out there today where I know I found the buyer. Uh, I worked to find the buyer. Um, I worked to find the seller and somehow it came together. And it's kind of cool. Yeah. And plus, absolutely. By now, I drive around town and I know a lot of businesses that, um, that we've transacted and, yeah. you know, touch wood, most have done well. Not every, not everybody's a success story, but most have done well. Well, you bring up an interesting point there. So you're dealing with a very emotional poor part of a business owner's life. You know, they've spent their entire life building this business. So it must be extremely an extremely emotional time. And I, I'm sure at some parts, extremely irrational. So how do you help guide the business owner through that crazy emotional time? that's man, you know, it's man to man, man to woman. It's like, see, that's, I spend, and we're probably going to talk about what I do on, uh, on my other job. Yes. So I, I have a lot, I, I am a minister as well, a deacon, and they're so, they just dovetail because they're all about the big questions in life. So my clients look at me and like, when I, and this is done, yeah, I'm finished. I'll tell you, I sat at a closing one day and I'm sitting in the middle. I've got on this side, I've got the son who runs the business. I, this guy, I've got the father who owns the business or inherited the business. Yeah, There's another son who's not there because he has a serious drug problem, which came out of the business, not directly, but indirectly. Sure. Yeah. And it's a sad, it's a sad story. The business was in decline. And so we got to closing the, and so we got to the end of the closing and the lawyer said, well, that's it. And the father looked right through me to the, to the son. He said, I guess that's it. Wow. I'm done. And it's something like my life, my life's work is done. It's over. Yeah. It's like, it's over. It was whatever he said was so, 
and and the son just breaks down and the dad wow. just breaks down and I'm in the middle of like, whoo, but you know what? That was like, it was, that was just orchestrated. Like the way we were sitting and whatever, I'll never forget that. But all the time, it's yeah. very emotional. People don't understand it. And they will, I will tell people, you will lash out at me. Well, right. I'm not going to lash out. I'm like, no, no, when you do, I'm gonna, here's the deal. You get three times and then I get <laughs> to lash out at you. Okay. And, and I tell them, they joke about that. And then finally you'll be on the phone and I'll be like, one, like, what are you talking about? That was the first time. Was- <laughs> you got two more. <laughs> right. And it's good to set that example because the emotions, they don't expect the emotions to come out. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the corporate world, it was other people's money. This is this is personal. This is it. Well, and then, you know, so much of an entrepreneur, the their business becomes their identity. And I think sometimes they, they feel like they lo- lose their identity if they're going to sell. Like, what are they going to do now that every day is Saturday? It's a good, it's a great question. But it, yeah. it is a great question that has to be dealt with. Yeah. And you know, men, most of my clients are men in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Okay. Okay. Not a group that's really good about, you know what, honey, I'm going to reinvent myself now. (laughs) You know, they don't change socks. And I'll tell you, I, you know, I I know I'm, I'm going, I'm there myself. I'm in my mid fifties. Yep. I can see it. I'm not looking to, although we do reinvent ourselves as business people. um, It's hard to do. Absolutely. What do you see as the biggest stumbling block to get most business overs over the hump of actually committing and saying, okay, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to sell. It's like anything else. You got to get up to bat. It's just, yeah. it, I mean, just, just like in your business, when you sit down and say to somebody, listen, let's, let's put a plan together. Here's what's possible. Here's what's going to hold you back. Let's just take an hour and just talk about it. Yeah. Then they can start to think, okay, yeah, I get it. But really the biggest, the biggest hurdle we have is the seller themselves. Yep. Because as you said, they become so part of the business, they cannot see themselves outside of the business. And I remember this when I left the corporate world, my cell phone would ring like a year later and I'd be like, damn, it's my boss. And guess what? I'd be like, no, 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 I'm an entrepreneur. That's a, that's a prospect. So it's that mindset change is really, really hard to change. Yeah. So for, for us, it's, you know what? I don't know if I even have been successful in doing that where I get someone to really seriously sit down and look at it. The thing I'll talk to 10 people who are business owners and I'll, I'll get them comfortable with, okay, we get it. You own Brandywine. Brandywine has a good reputation. Someday we'll use you. Moving them from there to we're seriously thinking about it is usually something that happens outside. Hmm. Their neighbor had a heart attack. One of my friends, one of my clients right now was neighbor 53, shoveling snow, drop dead. Yeah. His brother called me and said, we're selling this thing. Really? Right. Yeah. But see, that's we have been working with. He's like, this is serious. We're selling this thing because the important you know, things come into focus. That's it. That's it. So so really, that's what focus it. But it's that stuff on the outside when they finally have some level of epiphany on the outside, which is unfortunate because sometimes that incurs. Uh, I have one client right now. He's, you know, he, between chemo. We're taking yeah. phone calls between chemo. Now, it, it is what it is. And he, he doesn't want to leave this to his wife. But mm-hmm. Um, this business could have been sold five, six years ago. Yeah. You know, but nobody, but see, nobody was in his ear saying, you know what? You can sell it. This is how you sell it. And that's what obviously, you know, for those people not watching, Brian and I have known each other a long time. And he's been through the MA Mastery Program, yeah. which is to try to help people talk to their clients about you can sell it before well, you have to. Ab- absolutely. Let's talk about that right, real quick because <clears throat> you started this about a year or so ago. Maybe a little bit more. Well, I started during lockdown. Yeah. Okay. So during quarantine, mm-hmm. the MA Mastery Program, which is yep. an uh, online educational course that has live instruction with you. I, you know, I, I took the class and I thought it was fantastic and got a lot out of it. What was the impetus for you to start it? Where did you, how did you see the, the need for this in the marketplace? Because I will tell you, financial planners are notoriously not good at helping their client through this part or get, or recognize this. And then, you know, there's a lot that goes into the, to, to reasons for that, but wh- how did you, th- did you see this as a need in the marketplace? Well, this is the, at a, you know, at a necessity, right? So when you go into an MA market that comes to a stop or the MA market right now is booming, but in March of 2020, right? <laughs> like, I don't know when another deal is ever going to happen. I lived through 2008, 2009. We lived through 9-11. Yep. We've been around long enough to see these things. So I thought, okay, what can we do? And I've always wanted to do some type of uh, educational transferring my knowledge, which allows me to work outside of my geographic area. Okay, I have clients now in the MA Mastery Program, which are far, far away that I can reach through technology, right? Um, which is good. So I wanted to do that. But I really started thinking about setting something up where I'll be doing it for business owners. 
But then I went through the course with a friend of mine, David Newman, which you know, David. Yep. Um, and one of the aspects when we kind of came up with a course and he taught a course in this, and one of the things he talked about was, uh, you know, what's the highest and best use of the information? So if I help a business owner sell, um, which is tricky to find business owners, right? They're hard to find. Yep. They're hard to convince to do anything against their will. And then if you teach, if you show them, you know what you're talking about, they want you to do it. It's a great point. For them. Okay. Yep. But so they do love and, to and delegate. What for it. Yeah. What's that? I said they do love to delegate. Well, that's what I do. When, when someone comes to me, they're like, they know the stuff I'm like, dude, can you do this? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't want to learn what you do, I, but I will pay you to do it. Because Absolutely. Because I the outcome, right? Yeah. Financial advisors on the other side. So when you look at who are the people who could use the information, obviously financial advisors can, because I have worked closely with a number of financial advisors who happen to bring a referral by dumb luck, you know, a brother-in-law, a neighbor that has a $15 million business, <laughs> they bring it to us, we sell it and they're sitting there with 15 million bucks. Yeah. Like, like they don't even know how it happened. And I'm like, okay, well, just a little bit of effort yes. you know, to make sure the financial advisors in front, if these financial advisors can become skilled in this field yep. and they can go ahead and bring prospects in and the businesses they have, the business owners they have, they can bring over and a financial advisor can use this information over and over again. And they're used to investing in education. Very true. So that's, that's how I got to the financial advisor world. And frankly, they are the ones that can, that can use it the most um, yeah. and, and we'll do, and we'll do the work. For that, that's very true. Be, nothing worse than being a financial advisor and one of your clients sells a business and you miss out on that. We know about that, don't we, Brian? We do. We certainly do. Um, so <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <hard way. laughs> a little too close to home. Uh, anyway, yeah, so soon. let's talk a little bit about your personal life. So um, are you familiar with who Jim Gaffigan is? I am familiar with who Jim Gaffigan so is. Jim Gaffigan has a great joke, which I think is funny. Now, Jim Gaffigan has five kids. Matt Coyne has seven kids. So he said when he had his, he did a comedy special when he had his fourth kid, he said, when you tell people that you have four kids, they look at you crazy. And then they say, what's it like to have four kids? And he said, it's like drowning and someone throws you a baby. And so talk to us a little bit about, <laughs> I heard that one. talk to us a little bit about how having such a large family has had an impact on your life. You certainly, we learn from them a lot. It's funny you say that because people ask me, so I've had a kid in school since 2011 and I'll have one in school until my sixth grader upstairs um, uh, gets out of college. Yeah. Every year, it's pretty much one, they're all spread out, very little overlap. But someone say, what's that like? I said, go to the car dealership, <laughs> pick a car of your choice, drive it into the river and leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I do that every year. You're right. Because you spend all kinds of money. You get no satisfaction out of it. it. You're happy that you had it. You have the ability to buy it, but you get nothing out of it. And that's, so that's the financial side of it. But for us, we have like a, a huge diversity with inside of the family. And I have my oldest are almost 30. My oldest is almost 30. And I have one that's in sixth grade. So um, we've had the ability and some actually look a lot alike. Yeah. So, and you can tell their different personalities, who has whose personality. So you get to kind of relive it. And yeah. my one says, my one son, when he looks at one of my other children, he's like, you've been to this party before, start the intervention now. <laughs> you know, you know, it's coming, but, um, but it's great. It's great to have such diversity, especially now. I mean, we are kind of living in a bubble and the kids always have, and, and the older ones have moved back. Well, they, they all moved back except for right. one. And now they've kind of disseminated, they're back in New York and they've kind of gone back to their apartments and stuff. But there was a time we had six of seven living here over the summer, all summer. And we would sit out and talk on the porch for two hours. And Probably dinner. amazing, right? It was good. It was good. It's, I mean, this is, to be honest with you, this is not a bad time to have a big family because we don't know what isolation looks like because we just live in it. We live kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yep. Uh, our closest neighbors are, you know, ways away. And so we just have this little world going on. So yeah. That's been good. That That's fantastic. I love it. That's great. Um, going back to, to, to your core business, uh, Brandywine Mergers and Acquisitions, what do you see as the biggest stumbling block to helping a business owner actually sell their business? Got to unattach them from the business. They need to start to look at it like what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a money generating asset. Yeah. Right. And it is just that. And, and they might be the reason that it generates the money it does. Yeah. Um, so the two steps are one, start letting it generate money without you. 
you know, delegate, step aside from it. So this is all the stuff we really don't do, but there are people who do this. Let's see us do this. Yeah. A lot of consultants, which will say, okay, Brian, you're the, like with me, I'm the rainmaker. If I don't show up after a while, um, I have capable people, but I need to give them, um, I, and I am trying to do that, by the way, give them more stuff to do and try to take myself out of it more and more. Now, when you're an entrepreneur, you're the face of the business, people know you, all you need to be is available. Very true. But getting the person to separate themselves and say, that's a money generating asset that someone else can generate money with. As soon as they decide that that's the way they're going to look at their business, they can sell it. But, but they're so tied up and they feel, you know, what about my people? That's my favorite. Yeah. People, what will they think when I go away? I got, I'll tell you what they think. Ding dong. The witch is dead. <laughs> they got that is exactly it. what they think. Yeah. I've been to many closings and the people are like, thank God. Yeah. He was it's about so time. Grumpy. Yeah. What, so having that business not rely on the owner, that seems to be a pretty difficult issue for some businesses to overcome. Do you see it very often? All the time. It's extremely difficult to do. The only people who do that well um, are people who have found a consultant that they trust, mm -hmm. um, who, is, who they have said, I want this. Yep. I want to be, I want my business to be eventually run by a general manager. Now, if you're making, you know, if your business does $200,000 a year in revenue, you're not going to be able to hire a general manager to run you. But I'm talking about businesses that generate five, six, seven million dollars in top line revenue. Yeah. It's time for them because like when you start a business, you're a technician. Yep. Anyone who's ever read the e myth, right? You're the technician and then you have to become the, the manager. Not everybody has all that. Yeah. But to, to decide that, like if you said to me, Brian, you wanted to, separate from the business. You need somebody with you, a consultant that can sit back and say, we're going to set up an organization. We're going to hire people. And you're, Matt, you're going to have to get rid of this. And I'm like, no, I don't get, I do the books. I do the books. I do the books. Why do I do the, I do the books, by the way. Why right. do I do the books? I can do it in five minutes. But the reality is someone else can do it. And my mindset, I need to pull myself out. Yep. Um, that's a really difficult thing to do. It's something that's intentional and it needs outside help. When it's done, it's incredibly effective. By the way, if you do that, if you're a business owner, some business owner watching this, and you decide you want to separate from your business and you want to put someone to run it for you, you probably won't sell because hmm. you don't have to go. It's like if you're point. an owner, as opposed to the owner operator, yeah. well, you sell when the market is right. You sell when the taxes are right. You sell when you just decide it's just like you sell an investable asset, right. a stock or a bond. You sell yeah. when it's the right time to sell it. What I have is problem with people that they have that kind of, it's an asset and it's stuck to me. So I'm, I have, I'm, I'm stuck to it. You got to get out of that. That's yeah. what time, that takes time. It doesn't take, but three years. I was just going to ask when, when should, if someone's thinking about, someone owns a company that's thinking about selling, when should they start this process? It seems like you need to you need to, to make a long runway to get the, the most bang for your buck on the, on the, the exit, right? If you're 55 and you haven't done exit planning, we haven't talked to somebody. And, you, and by the way, the person you start with is, is your wealth advisor. That's yeah. you start, your financial advisor. That's where you start. If you haven't talked to them about what does the picture look like? Um, someone should, if, if, you know, if you work with Brian, you should go into Brian and say, Brian, I don't want to sell today. I don't want to sell tomorrow, but I know I'm going to sell someday. What do we need to put in place? That discussion, just enabling your advisors to do their job yeah. and tell them, this is what we would like to get to. What do we have to do and start listening? That should be 55. Yep. If you look at 65 as a traditional um, time to sell, I give you five years plus or minus an economic down cycle. Yep. Right. So you can be in position to sell 60 because depending upon your business, you might need to stay around for a couple of years. So yep. you have to have complete freedom at 65. You need to start at 55. Now, if someone says, well, someone made me an offer out of the blue tomorrow, don't run away. Don't run away. I'm just saying, if you had to plan when you're 55, like there's certain things you have to do at different ages at 50, 50 years old, I had to go and I get some exams I never had before. Not right. fun, but it was time to happen. Right. Yep. They said, that's when you go. Well, for me, it's 55. How, so how you, you bring up a really interesting part there because you, you know, I've, I've listened to you talk many times and you talk about how is your client or how is the business owner going to handle the unsolicited offer? How often do you see an unsolicited offer come in for someone that's not really in a position to sell so they can't make the most of it? I often tell new clients or new prospective clients, people I've met, I said, tell me about the offer you didn't take. Mm. And they all have one. Really? Uh, some guy told me a couple of years ago, I was worth 20 million bucks. Is the business worth 2 million? 
He said he would have paid me 20 million bucks, but yeah, I told him I wasn't ready. And I told him, usually they say something stupid like this. Well, my daughter's a junior in college. When she graduates, I'll sell. I'm like, what does that have to do with the price? Of <laughs> but they weren't mentally ready, right? They'd never talked about it. They didn't know what it was worth. So when yeah. someone sits at lunch with you and says it's worth 20 million, you're thinking, okay, I'm 65. I paid my house off. If someone's handing me 20 million, I'm going to be rich. And you would be right. right. But what do they think? Maybe it's worth 30. So they, 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 like seize up the best offer you're ever going to get is an unsolicited offer by yeah. someone by by a real buyer who has a real interest in you because they have something there's something created by the fact that they want you you fit you solve a problem for them and they're looking for you. you'll never get uh, let me put it this way you should that should be the best offer you ever get now they might be cheap i can't help with that but it should be one of the best offers and one that you don't have to you can then play coy right the whole you're way not looking to me, you're like, you know what? I don't have to do this. You call me, brother. Right. I don't need to do this. Your reps and warranties <laughs> in this agreement, that's not market. You want me to stay for a year? I'll stay for six months. You have all that leverage. Flip it around. Yeah. Flip it around. Go to the big guy who's got you know $500 million to spend and say, could you please peel a few of the notes off the top and help a me A couple out of shekels. Different? Now, we're never like that, but that's yeah. the dynamic. Right. Yeah. So when, when an unsolicited offer comes in, is that usually a third party that's doing a strategic buy or is it, do private equity firms make unsolicited offers? If you're a business owner out there, you're, you know that you get offers all the time. Yeah. You get calls from private equity groups, you get, you get letters, you get emails from people who you don't know are legit. What I would suggest, set up someone in your office, okay? Or your accountant, Yep. Uh, your attorney's probably not a good person because they're going to charge you a bit. <laughs> right. Your brother, pick somebody. When something comes in, boom, I send it to Brian. Brian, call these people and find out if they're real. And say, okay, and you can ask him simple questions. Okay, why are you interested in ABC Corporation? My yeah. friend my friend sent me this. He wanted to know why you're interested in it. And first thing is, we're not for sale, but we're curious about why. And if they say, well, we are looking to expand on the East Coast. We've done an analysis. You rank number three on our list. But Mm, now we got something as opposed to private equity group says we acquire companies between two and four million dollars of EBITDA and you know your guys like one million of EBITDA they don't know anything so right to separate the fishing expert you have to make the call I don't like to make the I don't like to have the owner make the call yeah but people send me those all the time and right. anybody why it'd be out there I love to make the call because I get to bust somebody's chops sure I'm like, why do you want to buy this company and sometimes <laughs> I'm like Oh, you do want to buy this company. Yeah. Well, I'll get back to you. But but you don't turn it away. As much as it's there's noise level and as many people are out there soliciting, yeah, because there's so much money out there, you got to kiss some frogs. Yeah. To to find the, the real prince, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you in there's a book called Walking to Destiny, written by the, the gentleman that owns the certified exit planning advisor company. His name's Scott Snyder, and he mentioned that. Uh, in, in his book that 80 to 90 percent of most business owners net worth is tied up in their business yet 70 percent of businesses will never sell and yeah. only about 14 percent of businesses actually sell for the value that they that they need or that they think they should get why do you think that that is or all the reasons we talked about is because nobody plans for it yeah i mean if you started a business without the idea of how you're going to get out of it. You got to think about that. And by the way, I did that. Yeah, sure. And by the way, I don't think my business is actually saleable because it's so dependent upon you. me and it's such a, it's the nature of the business, right? But that's beside the point. When you start a business, when you buy something, you should know how you're going to sell it. That makes sense. You that don't makes buy sense. a house with, with an easement in the back yeah. because you think it's going to impinge upon your ability to sell it. Same with a business. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the reason. Now, of course you have the, you know, the people invested in, in VCR production, um, you know, they, they just didn't, they just didn't bob and weave. Now they might've had 15 year great run and close the door and we'd all be happy to have the money they made. Right. But something that gets to the point where it becomes, it hits a peak and it has all the pieces in place and it's properly marketed and it goes out and it sells. Those are great, great scenarios, but I'll be honest with you between me and my competition, if we did, I don't know, 150 deals this year in the greater Delaware Valley, including down to Wilmington and around. So I'm in Malvern, right? Chester County. Yeah. If we did 150 deals, we'd be pigs and slop. Right. There's, there's like 40,000 businesses in the greater Delaware Valley. So the vast majority of them either don't think they can sell, don't know how to sell, or just simply won't even try. Yeah. Or the worst thing is they think their kids are going to take it over. 
Yeah. Well, so let's jump into that because, you know, the statistics for generational businesses are horrible. Mm -hmm. So how often are you doing a generational transfer or a generational sale that's successful? Um, never. And I say <laughs> never because people don't, people, to be fair, people don't come to me to help go from one generation to the next. That's I'm true. Like, so I, I am working with, a, I worked with a company. The decision they took was to give it to their son who is capable. He's an engineer. He'll do fine with it. That's it's yeah. rare. What we do more often is we have a son or a daughter who's pretty talented been in the business, we sell the business to a private equity group and the, and the son or daughter then steps up and runs it for the private equity group. That's, that's the more likely scenario in today's environment. Yeah. But a business that's going to sell for 5 million bucks, um, let's say my dad's business doesn't have a business, but let's say my dad had a $5 million business. He wanted to sell it to me yeah. for $5 million, fair market value. I go and I take an SBA loan. I put the house up. And now I hand my parents a check for $5 million. Yeah. Forget the down payment, but let's just... sure. Okay, now I'm on the hook for five million dollars. I used to just be the child of wealthy parents because my parents make, <laughs> you know, right? Because they had a good yeah. business. You're right. Now I own it myself. I've got a personal guarantee. My house is on the line, and if we're not doing well, I got to be paying the bank. And my parents are now living in Boca. Yeah, I know. Guess who's not happy? It's my partner upstairs. Yep. Is not, I'm in the basement, by the way. My sure. partner upstairs is not happy because now she's beholden to my parents for this $4 million loan. It's that, and by the way, that has nothing to do with the personalities I'm using here. Right. My wife, my wife actually might go along with that, but most there becomes, it's just too, too sticky. It's yeah. too Thanksgiving is ruined type of thing. So the yeah. best case scenario, if there's talented children, a private equity deal, if you do a private equity deal, mom and dad cash out big time, the kid gets a job. They were making a buck fifty before. Now they're making two fifty with some stock options and a bonus. Um, they have no more debt than they had before. They might have now ten percent share in the new company because they co-invested with the private equity group. There is a way to get your kids um, a, an above-average benefit of what you've done with your company and cashing out at the same time. And it's what the private equity world provides. And that's what we do. Yeah, you find those private equity deals for, for these people. If you bring me a company that's run really well by the parents and the kid, they've brought the kids along and trained the kids and the kids are really sharp. Yeah. All day. Private equity group want that all day because the kid's not going to screw the parents. Yeah. Okay. That's, not intentionally. Sure. But they, right. There's a better chance of, than some outside management team coming in there. It's a good scenario. But then again, do you train your kids? Brian, how old is your oldest? She's, she'll be 13 next week. Okay. She's not running your company yet, but I'll get news for you. When you find out when you get older and your kid wants to come, let's say she really loves what you do yeah. and she wants to come work with you. There's one thing about when your kid says they want to work for you. And then it's like, um, honey, did you finish that report? I made for the <laughs> client who's really angry right now. And they go, um, uh, do you remember mom said we could go to the beach today? Right. You know, and I'm not knocking my kids, but it's a very different scenario. It's very, very rare that you find an entrepreneurial kid who can step in and take over their parents' business. Because think about it. If they're an entrepreneur, they can do their own thing. And if they just want to be the lieutenant for the parents, what happens when you take the parents out? So it's not, it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. That but is, then that again, these tricky. are the conversations that you need to have yeah. with someone like, I, I put them back to the wealth advisor. Yeah, you have to flush all this out and make sure yeah. the sale is going to net what they actually need to live, not what they think that the business is worth. Yeah. You know? Um, obviously you, we talked about private equity. They have a ton of money right now. When someone asks you, this is a very oversimplified question, but is now a good time to sell my business? What do you say to that? All right. There's four things we look at. I just put out something on this. So four things we look at. One is how much money's out there right now. There's more private equity, dry powder, $521 billion of us buyout money sitting wow. on the sidelines more than there was this time last year. So more after the pandemic, more money's been raised, less has been spent. So the pile got bigger. Yeah, okay, that's number one. Number two, um, interest rates, historic lows. Right. Okay, for sure. Number three, how many businesses are on the market? If there were 100 businesses on the market back in March of 2020, yep, 30% um, of them went away by the fact that their, their industries have collapsed around them. Retail, nope. Gone. Restaurants, yeah. nope. Travel, entertainment, 
many types of leisure. Those are all on the sidelines for now. They'll come back, but right now they're on the sidelines. So the other folks that are out there that have been out there, you know, the construction businesses, right. um, essential businesses, I have a, my clients right now have had their best years ever. Why? Because I'm cherry picking the ones that did really well because they've continued to do well. They're incredibly attractive. You got this big pile of money chasing fewer businesses, yep. supply and demand. And the, and the fourth part's taxes. Yeah, the, the tax piece could be could be huge. I, I, for this up. year, yeah, for this year, I'll tell you, we're doing something we've never done before. April 15th, we are cutting off new engagements for this year. If you're not on the books by 20, because we expect we'll be, we'll have enough on the books by April. Yeah. But April 15th, if you're not on the books, we don't know if we can get you out by the end of the year. And people are hiring us now to get them out by 2021 because of capital gains do essentially double you'll be paying twice the tax in 2022 that you paid in 2021. And we don't want to take the risk of someone. We don't, what we don't want to do is be sitting here at Christmas. Yeah. 2021 and so, and the buyer going, uh, maybe we'll just drag to next, next couple more weeks. And then somebody <laughs> right. be like, I'll do anything. <laughs> right. No, you don't want to be there. We yep. want everybody up by Halloween. Wow. That, that makes, that makes a lot of sense though, to, to be able to do it that way. We did this during the Bush, when the Bush tax cuts went from 15 to 20, that yeah. was a 5% jump. And you'd have thought people were selling their children. Really? I mean, they were they were in a state of panic. We got to get out before capital gains go to 20%. <laughs> and I show my, my chart that said 20% is still historically low. 15 was like super, super low. But they become negligible to becoming ordinary income, essentially. Right. Um, so it is. So those four things lined up. This is the best year. If your business did well. Yeah. During the pandemic, this is your best year. If your business struggled, you're on the bench. So when you when you look at those businesses that did well because of the pandemic, are you able to say, you know, hey, yes, this is an this is an abnormal year because of the pandemic, but still able to get increased multiples because they survived through that? Or are some of those like construction companies maybe are they artificially inflated with their EBITDA because of because of the pandemic? Well, they're artificially inflated because they worked hard. They had total backlogs and they got PPP money. Yeah. So you got to carve out. I mean, so literally guys that were making 4 million made 6 million last year. Right. Yep. So we carve out the 2 million of the PPP, except yes. for if they paid someone to stay home, that's a different story. Yep. So it needs a little bit of massaging. Yeah. But businesses that did, you know, 3 million in the year before and did 4 million this year, they're cruising along. I don't expect multiples to shoot up. Unless yep. you get into a bidding war. I'm not optimistic enough to think we're going to get a lot of bidding wars. Right. But I will say this. The money that was raised has to be spent. Right. Yeah. You so have. the pool, it's supply and demand. People, people are going to do really, really well. I yeah. mean, we did deals during the pandemic. Um, I'm selling businesses. I've never seen the people, never met the people. Don't ever expect to meet the people. Yeah. I, I mean, see them on Zoom. Right. The virtual world has, is real now. Yeah. So it is, it's, to answer, it is a great time to sell. If you had a decent 2020, yeah. if you get your 2020 numbers back and they look a little bit like 2019 and you had a decent year um, and you want to sell in the next three to four years, it's now. If wow. you say, I'll wait till another administration, then that's fine. But it's a lot. It's all, Brian, as you say, it's all about the taxes. It's all, it's all about, about taxes. the taxes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, one question I have is I always notice that when a business owner talks about when they sell their business and then they have an earn out and they're working for someone that can create some friction. How often do you see that go south? Is it more the norm or is it more they play nice just to collect their check? Interesting. That's a great question. Um, it's a little bit of a mixed bag and that comes down to the humility section, right? Yeah. So the reality is if you think, if you're, an, if you're a totally independent person, yeah. Um, and you run your business with an iron fist, you're not going to enjoy working for somebody. Right. It's just a reality of it. Someone's good. The first thing I, I had a friend of mine, um, we have a good relationship to this day, and she would call me, she'd say, two weeks to get a business card. Two weeks. Can you imagine? <laughs> well, she's working now for a billion dollar company. You, she's like, well, all I wanted to do was change this thing on the logo. I'm like, you can't do that. It's, try, it's trying That's to park the, a cruise ship. Yeah, you, you, exactly. You can't yeah. do that. So her mentor, but she made it through. But I had to keep coaching her. I'm like, listen, just it's a big, giant machine. Whatever you did for, you know, you made a million. You, your product went out a million a year. Right. They're going out a hundred million a year. So the margin of error, you could fix it. They can't fix it at that level. So um, people do work well, but it is, it is, you just have to go into it with the right attitude. Yep. And yep. the right attitude is I have been, I'm grateful 
that these people wrote me or wired me $11 million. Right. Something that I started in my garage. I will give them a year of my time and I will do it um, in the right way. And I'll wait two weeks for my business card. Yeah. And I'll wait two weeks for my business card. And you wait two weeks for your business card because, you know, it don't matter. Right. I (laughs) retired last week. I called him on Friday. I'm like, you're done. He's like, we're done. We're out of here. You know, but they stayed for two, they stayed for two years. Yeah. But those last two years, they were employees. And I have to remind them, you are employees. Yep. And what does an employee do? Works their butt off for the company, but you don't own it. Right. Exactly. Yep. And they're You're- like, thank God we didn't own it during the pandemic. That's all I can say. Yeah. you Good point. <clears throat> one, one question I wanted to ask you. I, I have uh, your book right here. Straight wow. talk from the front lines. So you wrote a book. How difficult was this to do? I I dictated it. Really? Yep. I did actually, I used um, voice recognition software and I dictated it. Really? Like a uh, rocket fish or whatever that one was back in the uh, Whatever it's called. What, I forget the name of it at the time. It was a couple of years ago. Um, uh, whatever it was. It, I basically just spoke into my little headset. I made a little microphone and I'd walk around my office and yeah. just talk. So why did, why did you write it? Um, I wrote it for a couple of, one, I wanted to have something that I could pass on some of the information. Uh, I do sell it. So it's yeah. a profit center, which is okay. nice. Um, but I usually give it away mostly. And frankly, I give it to financial advisors to give to their clients. And it's a nice, it's a nice leave behind piece. Yeah. Um, but I did it. In, so the first half talks about how to sell a business. And the second half talks about how to make it. It's got two parts. The second half, how to make it more attractive. So if you, if you read this book and you read the second half, it's going to tell you how to make your business very saleable for more money if you do what's in the book. Now, I could also tell you, Brian, how to you know lose 15 pounds and you know get a better body mass. You got to do the work, but I tell you how to do the work. Yeah. And I so um, I give it to people from time to time. They do it and they call me and they're like, dude, I killed it. Right. I follow you know, the I plan. nothing to do with the sale of their business, but like, dude, just you know, you told me to change my name from you know Brian Carney Inc. to you know something different. Sure. And that, you know, that made all the difference. It's the little things that you need to do when you have time yep, are, are in that book. And it also breaks it down for somebody. So if someone doesn't know how a business sells, when you're done with that, you know how it sells, you know, the yeah. concepts, how it's the game different than what you might think. Right. For sure. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, I, we have time for, I just, one more question for you. So doing this job for so having your business for 20 years, you probably have incredible stories, either great stories of success or the polar opposite where you see you've seen really bad mistakes be made does any particular story one way or the other stick out to you for one of your clients that you worked with um probably we had we did a really nice deal uh two or three years ago for a, just a nice nice lady and she showed up and met her in a coffee shop and she was doing a couple hundred thousand dollars in earnings and business might have been worth three million four million yeah. and she did the work, you yeah. know, she did the work. She stuck with us. Uh, we worked together for about a year and a half and then we took a break because she felt the market was going to shift a bit. Yeah. Um, up or down called me six months later and had taken the upward shift and we sold her business for probably five times. Wow. What we originally thought we could sell for, which was great for her and great for us. Sure. Yeah. We all, win. it was great. Cause I remember win. I t- and I, and I did this and this deal closed while I was on a retreat yeah. before my ordination. So it was a five day silent retreat. So I couldn't be near my phone except for like one hour at night. And I remember I went back to my room and, and the, uh, the attorney, our attorney um, had continuing education on the day we were going to close. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, and so the buyer says, listen, so we, since we can't do it tomorrow, we want to do it right now. Wow. So right now, so I made a couple of scrambling phone calls and I couldn't find the attorney, couldn't find the attorney. So I look him up. I know where he lives, 25 minutes away from where I'm at. So I'm like, I call my client. I'm like, do you mind if I go knock on his door? She's like, go for it, buddy. So I'm, I'm there, I'm 20 minutes. I, I, I drive him halfway to his house, say 20 minutes in. And he finally picks up my call. He's watching a movie with his kids. Got on the phone, had a closing phone call, all good. And then wired more money than this woman will. And she's young. She'll never work a day in her life. Amazing. And I just remember going back to the retreat that night. And I said to Lisa, I said, uh, yeah, we, uh, we said, how's your deal going? I said, closed. She goes, I thought wasn't supposed to close till tomorrow. I said, it closed. And then I remember walking out of the room. She said, well, how much money did we make on it? She walked out of the room. I told her and she went. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's just one of those things. Everybody hits a home run every once in a while, but you know what? 
it was, and, and she was just the nicest person to work for. Yeah. And she was as happy for us as we are for her. And, you know, sometimes it works out, but you know what? She didn't do anything special. Yeah. In fact, her business wasn't even prepared for sale. Wow. We worked our butts off. We had to patch together shoe boxes of receipts and things. But you know what? She had something that somebody wanted. Yep. She was willing to listen to them at a young age when they were there at the door and they were fighting over her. And if you're ever in a position where people are fighting over you and you push back on principle or some something like, uh, I don't feel I could sell it. It's my family heritage. Well, think about it because you know what she's doing now? Whatever she wants. Exactly. And she opens up <laughs> and another that's a beautiful business. thing. Yeah, but she and by the way, it ain't snowing where she is. Right, <laughs> exactly. So, I love I mean, it. so those are those are. I mean, and I have all kinds of stories like that. That one kind of sticks out. But it's nice when things come together. But this is out there for everybody, and you, your statistics are right. Yeah. But if any, the, I would say on those statistics of the people that work with an advisor and put some thought and effort into it and learn how a business sells in a, in a two hour read of a book. Yep. Um, they, they sell. Yeah, they sell at a high rate, a high percentage rate. Because if I could take ten business owners now and I could quiz them on how a business owner sells, nine out of ten wouldn't get it, wouldn't know what I was talking about. The yep. one who does understand it, I put my money on him. He's ahead of the game right now. Yep. They'll sell. That's great. that's what you guys have to do. That's what you wealth advisors at. There, yep. spread the news, man. Love it. Well, Matt, this was great. I appreciate your time so much. I it's great to talk to you, Brian. Always, and I, I, I'm just so enjoying. I'm completely wired. With from my the, uh, my morphine. Well, this this beer that I had was actually pretty pretty good. I would it's definitely a fall beer, so I'm a little bit late to the game. And it uh, it's made apparently with uh, I'm looking at the the notes: vanilla, ginger, turmeric, anise, and cinnamon. So I'd give it a three point five out of five. I would drink it again. Um, so <laughs> that was always my rule. I Maybe, usually would drink it again yeah. back in the day. Mm. I didn't, you know, if it didn't like hurt me or I didn't like break out in spots, we'll go again. I've, I've had worse. That's for sure. Well, <laughs> thanks again, Matt. So uh, as someone who has actually gone through your program, I can't recommend the M&A mastery program enough to other financial planners out there. Definitely something that you guys should be, should be looking into. Um, so, and if you're a financial advisor wanting to learn more about how to help your clients check out the website at mastery-program.com. That's right. If you'd like to learn more about Matt's business or to buy his book, Straight Talk from the Front Lines, go to his website at bmathenumber1.com. Matt, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Cheers. Brian, pleasure, my friend. Peace. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur, sponsored by River's Edge Advisors. For more information on how River's Edge Advisors can help you, visit their website at riversedgeadvisors.com. If you'd like to connect with Brian Carney for business advice or just to share a beer, follow him on Instagram at riversedgeadvisors underscore LLC.